uh, come together and study your word and as we wrap up this teaching on the rapture that it would be edifying to all of us and that we would just appre appreciate the uh, the reason that you have had Paul write so much about it and that it is a, a, a doctrine that is uh, not escapism but it is in fact uh, to the, something that we should be comforted in and should be edified with um, and not have any hope about those that have, that have died but that we will be reunited with them again and then of course uh, we'll spend eternity in the heavenly places with your son. Thank you for your love and thank you for your grace. In your name, amen. Amen. So Romans 8. And Mark and Tammy are here, or Mark and Ginny are here too. So hello everybody on Zoom. Uh, Romans 8, verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. In the past, this is, this is why we're talking about the rapture because there in verse 23 he talks about uh, the adoption to wit, which means that is the redemption of our body. And the redemption of our body as we've looked is the redemption of the purchased possession which is us, which is the rapture where our bodies get changed like unto his glorious body. And as, we, as we've seen, there's going to come a time when he calls the, the day of Christ where the Lord Jesus Christ is gonna return He's going to, with a trumpet, the voice of the archangel. What's the third one? Trumpet, voice of the archangel. Oh, and a shout. And a shout. And a shout. He's going to return. The, the trumpet will blow. The dead in Christ will rise first. The trumpet will blow again. The alive in Christ, those that are alive, will, will, will meet in the air. We'll meet Jesus Christ in the air, not on the planet. In the air, we'll go to the judgment seat of Christ, where Christ essentially presents the church to himself. And then he's going to turn around and deliver the up to his, to his father. We've seen that. Last week we looked at the, and that should provide us great comfort that we're not going to go through the wrath to come. We're not going to go right. through the, what is called the yep. tribulation. I'm not going to reteach this because it took us three weeks, but then last week we looked at that, that timeline in Daniel. Trying to figure out the, the timing. Not so much when will the rapture happen, but what, what has to happen with the rapture before the tribulation can happen. We saw Daniel's timeline laid out that extra year that Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in the parable gave him. Right. And then the wrath to come was supposed to fall right there. When they rejected Stephen, the wrath to come should have happened. Right. But it didn't because God raised Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus Christ returned, raised up Saul, the apostle Paul, ushered in the dispensation of grace and the information about the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. The wrath to come hasn't come. Then we went over and we looked at the issues last time about what withholdeth withholdeth and he who letteth will let we looked at that issues what's stopping this from happening the dispensation of grace right okay and the church of body of christ the what is the dispensation of grace the he is the church of body of christ church of body of christ didn't get raptured out we just talked about that that's when the dispensation of grace comes to an end and then the wrath to come isaiah 13 9 talks about it being wrath john the baptist in matthew 3 7 calls it the wrath to come and we've seen also, we'll see again today, the, the wrath, that seven-year tribulation. Some people want to divide the titles, different parts of it into different titles. I don't have a problem with that, but we'll, we'll see that. But this, uh, these events over here can't happen until the rapture happens, okay? All right. Good morning, Bill. All right, so I'm just going to go through, as I put these lessons together the last few weeks, I just had a yellow notepad, and I said, that's something we need to come back and revisit, and that's something we need to come back and revisit, and that's something we need to come back and revisit. So today, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go back and revisit all those things that didn't really have a place as we went through. So if you would, come with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. The first thing we want to make sure that we understand is we are not going through the tribulation. Now, these are the verses we looked at last week, 2 Thessalonians 2, um, 1 through 
12, where we talked about that issue of the dispensation of grace in the church body of Christ withholding and not letting that, that to come across. And I, we're not going to read through those verses again. But at the end, look at verse 12. Uh, verse 13, rather. He says, as he, after he's given a description of that, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The salvation in the verse there is not salvation from hell. He's not talking about your soul salvation. The salvation he's talking about is in the context of 2 Thessalonians 2. It's from the issue, it's from the day of the Lord. Remember that somebody had written them? They called it the day of Christ, but it was right. really the day of the Lord is what they mm -hmm. were talking about. They misidentified it either by accident or on purpose, but it was deceiving them. And he goes on and he tells you when the day of the Lord is going to happen. He says, hey, from the beginning, the beginning here is the dispensation of grace. From the very beginning of the dispensation of grace, you've been chosen to not go through that. If, you're, if you believe the gospel, okay, you see that you're, you were, we're called by the gospel. So the salvation there that, he, that Paul's thankful for is that we've been chosen to salvation. Salvation from what? Salvation from, from the wrath to come. From this and we don't even go through it. We won't even be on the planet. Right. It's not something we need to worry about. We don't need to worry about the mark of the beast. We don't need to worry about, about all, those, about all those, those issues. We don't even need to worry that the Antichrist, that we're not going to recognize the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist could be on the planet now. Because the rapture could happen in a minute. Right. Or the Antichrist might not be born for a million years. So we don't need to worry about, about that. That, that. We have no part in that. We'll see that um, today. Come with me to 1 Thessalonians 1. First Thessalonians 1, verse 10. And he says, speaking to the Thessalonians, I don't have the mic on, do I? No, oh, you don't. Says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which what? Delivered us from the wrath to come. That wrath to come is a phrase that John the Baptist used, like I said, over in Matthew 3, 7, to describe the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul tells the Thessalonians, they, and have been there by us, that we have been delivered from the wrath to come. Well, that sounds a lot better. Okay, look at that, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 9. He says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God has not appointed us to this issue over here. It's not something that we have to worry about. Now, is Israel appointed to that? They are, aren't they? Yeah. Israel is totally appointed to that wrath to come. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, as we saw last week. So while we're here in 1 Thessalonians, let's go through this passage because there's something interesting in it. We'll start in chapter 5 and verse 1. Chapter 4 is what we often call the rapture chapter, where from verse 13 down to verse 18, he talks about the issues of the rapture and the dead in Christ rising first, okay? Verse 18 of chapter 4, he says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have, no, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that... Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So here he's talking about the day of the Lord. 
And you can see that because he clearly identifies it in, chapter, in verse 2. Now that issue of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write, on, write unto you. That is a distinctly Jewish or Israel phrase. Keep your hand here and look at Acts 1. Acts 1 and verse 6. This, the, the, the apostles, including Peter, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. That ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, when they're asking about that kingdom, Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Their kingdom is based on some times and some seasons. Mm -hmm. The times, what time? Daniel's timeline. Israel's history is full of timelines. Right. He told Abraham, your people are going to go down for 400 years, and then they're going to come back out. Revelation is a timeline. Revelation just lays out the details of what's going to happen in here. Everything about Israel's program is based on a timeline and right. the times of the seasons. Do you guys remember why God made the ordinances in the sky? Come back, come back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. The very creation, the very signs that he puts out there, that the ordinances in the heavenly places, are for times and for seasons. Mm -hmm. That has to do with the earth. We, we shouldn't be out there. We, we shouldn't be out there looking, trying to figure out, okay, when's it going to happen? Right. It's no concern of ours. Because why, why, is, why is when this happens not a concern of ours? Because we're going to be wrapped we're right not now. Even be at, we're not even going to be right. in here. There's also that understanding that there's probably some form of delay. Some people think it's one year, seven years, 14 years, between the, the, the end of the rapture and when the tribulation actually starts. Okay? But what I want you to see in the passage there is he's, he has no need, there's no need for Paul to write into them about the signs of the seasons, the times and the seasons, because it's got nothing to do with us. Right. You know, all, all these prophecy preachers that are out there preaching, will see there's this sign, and there's this sign, and there's this sign, and there's this sign. You know how you know they're heretical teachers? They're looking for the signs. The very fact that they're teaching what they're teaching tells you you shouldn't follow, it, follow them. I know that's tough talk, but that's the truth. And you're seeing some of that actually in, in grace circles. Oh yeah, this is so bad, you know, that the, the <laughs> I got my second shot this week and somebody reminded me that the, the proper name, the Fauci ouchie. <laughs> or I got it over here, <laughs> Fauci ouchie. I know, I love that. <laughs> and, that's so funny. And I got all, oh, and it made me sick. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 after I left Thursday night Bible study, I got a Thursday. I got, I just felt like, I, I had like the 48 hour flu, but I condensed it down, down to about seven hours. And uh, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep, but it, it was crazy. I got so cold, and then I got mega hot, and then I narrowed out, but I couldn't go back to sleep, so. But anyhow, the, the, you know, people are worried that, okay, that's, that, or I guess it's actually over here, but, but that's the, uh, um, that's the mark of the beast, or that's the groundwork, and this is what's coming, you know. Hey, it could be 10,000 years. It could be a million years. We, we don't, don't look for yeah. the signs of the times. We don't. A lot of people thought, okay, well, in 1948, when Israel got reconstituted, that was, that was, it was going to be any day. And people have done a countdown since that time, and every countdown's got missed. Okay? We don't need to look for the time of the season. It's got nothing to do with us. Right. It's got nothing to do with us. Verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. That day clearly is the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord comes what? As a thief in the night. Right. What does verse 4 tell you? Are you in the day or are you in the night? We're in the day. Okay. So then that you don't need to worry about that day. Because that day is coming as night, as a thief in the night. Right. But you're in the day. Yep. It's just not who you are. Right. If you just let the verses mean what the verses say, you can see clearly, verse 5, you're the children of light, right. the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Mm -hmm. We're not part of that. Right. There's, there's another verse that tells you, and, and Paul's telling you, you don't need to worry about that because you're not part of it. Mm -hmm. That's a thief in the night type stuff. You're in the day. You're in the day. Well, come with me if you would. Um, we're going to just run some verses on this. Uh, look at uh, Matthew 24. I'll put a mark in Matthew 24 because we'll be in and out of there several times. Matthew 24, verse 43. He says, uh, verse 42, Watch therefore... For ye know not when what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. You, you, you see the issue? Even Jesus is saying, hey, he's going to come as a thief. He's not going to come in the daytime. Okay? Look over at Revelation 3. Revelation 3. Verse 3. He says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. Now, of course, we know Revelation is written to the little flock. Okay, so when Paul talks about the day of the life, you want, day of the Lord, he wants you to think about it in the thief of the night. You're of the day, not of the night. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Verse 3, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Look with me over at Jeremiah 14. This room got very warm again. Jeremiah 14 and verse 13. Jeremiah 14, 13 says, Then said I, O Lord God, Behold, the prophet said to them, You shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Now this is a, this is a prophecy that comes to to pass in their lifetime, but it also is going to come, is prophetic about what's coming. So you okay. see what the prophets are telling them? Peace and safety. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thought, a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword the famine shall those prophets, and famine shall those prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. See, this is a prophecy about what's going to happen in this time. There's going to be people saying peace and safety out here. They're going to be prophets. What are they going to say peace and safety? The covenant. The man of sin. He made that. We have peace now. We've made a covenant. We have peace and safety. And God's going to come. He's going to destroy them. That's part of what this tribulation is about. It's to purge out the nation. And how are they going to know those, pro those the prophets that are prophesying in this time are not prophesying the truth? 
So it'll be against God's word. Right. It yeah. won't line up with Hebrews or Revelation, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look with me over to Ezekiel 13. Again, this has to, to do, there's a twofold fulfillment of this here. Look at chapter Ezekiel 13 and verse 10. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with an untempered mortar. Say unto them that daubed it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall, there shall be an overflowing shower, O ye, and ye, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore thus saith the Lord, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in my anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So shall, will I break down the wall, and so on. Again, uh, verse 15, thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall. Peace and safety. When they're looking and saying, peace and safety, they need to not understand there's a sudden destruction that's going to come upon them at that time. Um, look over at Daniel 9. Daniel 9, verse 27. We looked at this last time. But he said, and, she, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So there's, a, there's going to be that peace covenant. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. They're going to say they have, think they have peace and safety because they're going to sign that peace covenant. And when they do, sudden destruction is going to come. They're going to make that sign. Three and a half years later, he's going to break it, and all and sudden destruction is going to come. And it's going to be this terrible time, what was so often called the Great Tribulation. Okay, those last three and a, three and a half years. Um, so I guess just really that really finishes this section here. But what I want you to see here is. He's, here Paul is talking about the day of the Lord. He says, it's coming as a thief in the night. Mm -hmm. We're children of the day. We're not children of the night. We don't need to worry about it because it's not something that's going to happen in our time, right? We're going to have the day, the church can get raptured out, and then the night's going to come. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then he's going to come as a thief in the night. They're not going to know when he's going to come. Mm -hmm. They're going to say peace and safety. And it's not going to It's not going to be so. Okay. So I want to look now at just... Some miscellaneous observations and uh, objections that I have seen as we go through here. So look at 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy 4, verse 1. Second Timothy 4, verse 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You see both the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment in here. Uh -huh. He shall judge the quick, those are the ones that are made alive. Keep your hand here and look at Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? Mm -hmm. He's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing 
and his kingdom. He's going to judge the quick, those he's made alive at his appearing. That's the rapture. That's where the, the, those that are made alive. Now we're talking about the church body of Christ here. Those members that are members of the church body of Christ, those ones that have been quickened, they're going to get judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And remember, it's not about condemnation, it's about praise. Because of what was done in the Lord, not in your flesh. No man should glory in his flesh. And the dead are going to get judged at his kingdom. We won't have it drawn up over there, but over here, he's going to return. That second coming, there's going to be the kingdom. And then after that thousand years, the great white throne judgment. So what you see in that verse of Timothy, he's, he's talking about, Paul's talking about both of the situations there. The quick and the appearing is the judgment seat of Christ. The dead and the kingdom, because he's going to judge at the kingdom, judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That final judgment there. Well, I want you to be aware, in that verse, you do see both of them. Because the dead, the physical dead will get that are in Christ will be get judged. Well, go to the judgment seat of Christ, but the spiritually dead have not, nothing to do with the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. The great white throne judgment is only for unbelievers. Okay. Um, look at First Corinthians fifteen. Like these are just notes I made as I put this together that I couldn't find the place to put in other places, so we'll just go through them today and make notes so you can study these things out. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. And verse, uh, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So this is really the culmination of everything. When you get down to verse 26, we are now out here in the dispensation of the fullness of time where ages to come are coming. Mm -hmm. right. even, death, even death is no longer an issue. Right. What I want you to see here in the passage, though, is you see uh, in verse 23, where he says, that every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits after they that are Christ that is coming, well, we've looked at this, but there's an order to the resurrections. The first one is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. okay, other people have been resurrected, right? In the Bible. But they all died. Right. Right. Elijah fell on the guy's bones. He rose again. Jesus yelled over, hey, Lazarus, come out. You know Lazarus saying, no, I really don't want to. <laughs> but Lazarus, he, 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 he rose again. Paul raised again. The, the kid, you know, he... Talk to him midnight. The kid fell out the window. Paul goes down, raises him. And, and P Peter does some of these things. You know, one thing I want you to see is they all died again. Right. We're talking about the resurrection to never die again here. Okay? So the order. The Lord Jesus Christ, the church, the body of Christ, at the rapture, true Israel as they go into the earthly millennial kingdom. And then, out here, the unbelievers. So they see that there's, there's an order. Every person's going to go at their time. They're not going to go, you're not going to have a member of the little flock get raptured. These people right. who got saved back here aren't getting raptured with the church and body of Christ. Right. That's not their order yet. The other thing I want you to see, you see it in verse 22 where it says, For as an Adam all die, even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. It's an interesting thing there, verse there. Now, is he saying that everybody is going to get saved? No. No, but everybody does get resurrected. Everybody gets resurrected. And we'll, we'll show you that in a sec. Even as an, as an Adam all die, and everybody in Adam dies, right? Right. 
even so in Christ shall all be made alive. We're going to let the all be the same in both, in both the first part and the second part of the verse. So let's just look at some of these things. Um, come with me to Acts. Uh, let's go in order. Go to Daniel 2, 12. Daniel 12. If you've ever heard anybody teach, too, that uh, there's the, this issue of the unsaved, they just get annihilated. They just don't exist anymore. That's not true. And these three verses we're going to look at, we'll show you that. Huh. Daniel 12, uh, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as was never since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. You see, those are unbelievers that are getting resurrected right there. They're coming out of the grave. They're going to awake. because they sleep in the dust of the earth, they're going to awake, but some only to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay? Look with me over at John 5. Uh, verse 26 John 5 26 for as the father hath life in himself so hath he given to the son to have life in, in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now it's important to understand this verse, by the way, rightly divided. Because this is talking about a person's works. We're not judged according to our works. The thing I want to just pull out here today is I want you to see that they're getting resurrected, some in, again to life and some to, death. to damnation. Okay, look at Acts 24. Acts 24, verse 15. This is Paul speaking. Uh, verse 14. He's given a defense of himself. But I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Everybody's getting resurrected. Right. Okay. Now we talk about being resurrected and, and what we know what we mean, resurrected to spend eternity in the heavenly places. And, and I'm fine with that conversation, but don't ever forget that the dead get resurrected too, right. but to eternal damnation. The, the teaching out there of annihilation of the soul that they just cease existing is not true. The Bible clearly teaches they're going to come out of the grave and they're going to go into eternal damnation. There was a question that came up about um, what time is it? About the um, you know, I'm going to run out of time here. There was a thing. A, a question came up about, about the trump, the trump that Paul talks about versus the trumpets of Revelation, and they, okay. they often get confused and conflated. Mm -hmm. So let's just look at those real quick. Um, you're in First Corinthians 15. Look at First Corinthians 15:52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. We've looked at this before, but the trump's going to sound, first trump, and the dead in Christ rise first. That's the first trump, and at the last trump, the alive. Well, if this is the first one, and it happens like that, then this would be the, what we call the second trump. The Bible calls it the last trump. 
But here we're only talking about two trumps. Yeah, the first trump and the second trump. Now the trump is simply the, the voice, the, 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 the noise that the trumpet makes. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain. Okay, this trump, the trump, again, is just the sound that the trumpet makes. This, this is called the trump of God. Well, where do you think the trump of God comes from? God. The trumpet, the trumpet of God, right? Okay. So there's two trump there, there's two trumps that sound. Seems to be only one trumpet to me, but hey, come with me if you would over to Revelation. Revelation eight. Now again, and if you, you you've studied this out, you know these can't be the same anyhow, because these other ones don't happen until out here in the tribulation, and we're not even there for that. The little Revelation 8 and verse 2. Verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay, so the trumpets are given to the angels. Look down at verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves sound mm -hmm. okay and then and then they go on and, and they sound look down at verse 13 and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels the voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound in Revelation these these trumpets and the trump the sound of the trumpet is said to be what? Of God? The angels? Of angels. And if you think that's just a play on words, no, it's an identification. That lets you know, that's that lets you know that these trumpets that are said to be of the given to the angels and said to be of the angels aren't the same as the trump of God. Okay. Okay? This talks about the voice of the trumpets of the angels. So that's the trump. The trump of the angels is not the same as the trump of God. They're identified differently. We're going to let them be different. Right. Okay? That will help with your confusion, too, if you understand. They don't have anything to do with each other. But again, rightly dividing the word of truth will help you with those things. Okay. Um, what do we have? 1040. Yeah. So let's see here. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 1. Second Thessalonians 1 and Matthew 25. Second Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Notice in verse 3, the hope is not there. In 1 Thessalonians, oh, yeah. he told them they had faith, charity, and hope. By the time he gets to 2 Thessalonians, they've lost their hope. They've lost this teaching of the rapture. So now he's, he's, he's talking about the patience and the faith that they have in their persecutions and the tribulations that they're enduring. Now he's going to tell them what God will do about that. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. 
when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when has he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired, admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that your God would count you worthy of this calling and fill all the good pleasure of his goodness and work of faith with power. What I want you to see here is this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 7, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, that is not the rapture. That's the second coming. That's this coming right here. When, when the rapture happens, it's not a moment of vengeance. It's a moment of praise and removing the church of body of Christ from the right. planet. Out here, though, this is going to be a time of vengeance. Right. Okay? So understand, in 1 Thessalonians 3, or 1 Thessalonians 1 here, 3 through 12, Paul's not talking about the rapture, but the prophesied second coming. Okay? Come with me over to Matthew 25. In verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, that's what Paul just described, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left, and shall say, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared to, for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, ye came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, or clothed thee? Or when... Saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visit me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when we saw thee a hungered or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, it did not minister unto thee. Then shall they answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye did it not unto one of the least of these, ye did it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. What you're seeing here is this judgment that Paul was talking about. The Lord's going to have vengeance on, on those that reject him. Here you see it in a national issue. And he even, I don't know if you caught it, even the nations that don't know when they've blessed the Lord get credit for blessing the Lord. Now, the, the ethos of the little ones, he's talking about, did they bless the little, flock, the little flock? Did they help the little flock go through the tribulation? But you see, the nations ask the question, when did we do this, Lord? And he says, well, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. So that's what Paul's talking about, that vengeance. The nations are either going to go into the kingdom or they're going to go into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, There's a national issue there and also, of course, an individual individual there. Um, hey, can I ask a question real quick? Jenny, yeah. Jenny has a question. Yeah. How do you separate the national salvation or judgment from the individual judgment? Because if if an entire nation is condemned, I'm assuming there's people within that nation that are saved, and then vice versa. If there's, yeah. So how how does exactly how does it, think back to when to the way Israel God dealt with Israel when the king, and Judah when the king was good, the nation the, the entire nation received blessing, even the evil people. Right. Okay. When the nation when, when the king was bad, the whole nation received the curses. Even, even the, the righteous people. people, but the righteous people still were righteous. So what you'll have in the, what you'll have in this time is as as the national leadership go goes, they'll all go 
into the, into the lake of fire. The, if, if there's an individual, though, in that evil nation that blessed Israel, even if they didn't know it, they will escape that judgment. Okay. It's going to come okay, down that nationally. Immediately, though, right? Yeah. Now, the other thing okay. is, though, if a nation does bless, if there's somebody that actively rejected that, then they will go into the lake of fire as well, right? Okay. When times were good in Israel and an evil person died, they didn't get credit and get to spend eternity in the kingdom. They, they're hell bound. Just like when time, times were bad in the nation and God was cursing the nation, if a righteous person died, they, were still righteous. they will have a resurrection into the kingdom. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It, it, it definitely. Thank you. And I okay. should have should have picked that up. So it happens, but the judgment happens right then and there. Right, so, and, and, and the judgment happens. Right. And see, what God does in the in, in the description is He just brings the nations and, and lines the nations up. You know, He's probably dealing with heads of state. I mean, it, who knows exactly how it's going to be? But He's going to line those nations up, and He's going to discuss it with them. And it, it's, it's amazing. To, what's amazing to me, though is the fact that the, the, the good nations, the sheep, they don't even know when they've done it, some of them. Huh. And they get credit huh. for it. Interesting. That's awesome. Yeah, interesting. That's truly awesome. Okay, look at Matthew 24, verse 3. We're going to go through this chapter. We're going to go through it really quick, though. Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What they're looking for is the end of the world so that this thing can happen and they can go into the kingdom. They're not anticipating the earth blowing up. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. What man's going to deceive them? The Antichrist. The man of sin, the son of perdition, and all his acolytes. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Right? We saw that with the prophets. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So people will, some, and I don't really have a problem with this, but we'll, we'll, we'll call this the beginning of sorrows. Now, you see the thing where he talks about there? You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Right. And you're going to hear of, the, and there should be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. This is where you get to think I'm nuts. Since Cain killed Abel, has there ever been a time when there haven't been wars or disasters on the planet? Huh. There really hasn't. There haven't. There's always been so, something. So what would make that verse, if, if you heard... Let me ask you this. Did you know there's a war going on in Jerusalem right now? No. Do you care? Is it, is, I mean, is it newsworthy to you? Isn't there always a war going on in the Middle yeah, East, right? right? Right, Did you know that there's a war going on in Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran? But it there's always a war. <laughs> it doesn't surprise you. Did you know that there were seven earthquakes off the Oregon coast in the last few days? No. Doesn't surprise you, does it? Because they're always there. So when is that verse going to... You ever think about that? When is that verse going to... When is it going to be a big deal that there's a war or a rumor or a war? What in happens the, in the, the first three and a half years. What happens at the beginning? There's that peace, it's peace treaty signed. Right. That peace treaty in the Middle East is signed. And it's going to be a real peace. Right. I think it's going to be it's going to be a real peace based on these verses that they've never known before. It also says we're not going to look at the verses now, but that he's going to come with line with signs and wonders. I believe the earth is going to be quiet too. Mm. 
I believe there won't be any nations fighting each other. I believe, based on that verse, that we're not going to have earthquakes. We're not going to have pestilences. When was the last time you heard of a pestilence, huh? Um, I think there's going to be three and a half years where it's going to be quiet. Maybe three years, maybe two and a half years, whatever. And then they're going to start to hear the rumors. And then, the, and then those things are going to happen. That will be the beginning of sorrows. It's going to be an interesting time to be alive. And remember, Paul tells us we're always going to have those things with us. That's another way you know these things are different. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and he's speaking to the, tw- the little flock here, and kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Right? There's the issue that we read about when Jesus is going to judge the nations. How did they respond to this little flock? And then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. What are those prophets going to say? Safe and pe- peace and safety. Yeah. Peace and safety. And because iniquity shall abound, there's a mystery of iniquity, the love of many shall wax cold. It's going to be a lot of hate on the planet. Do you think there's hate now? Wow. There's going to be hate. There's going to be hate. Worse. Big time. And he that shall that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. If he that they endure, if they don't go after all that system, that they're going to be saved. Now, endure to the end doesn't mean the end of the tribulation necessarily, because they might get beheaded in the middle of that tribulation. But as long as they endure, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The question is, what's, what's this gospel of the kingdom? Well, it's back in verse 13. The gospel of the kingdom shall preach into the world as a witness to all nations. The gospel is going to be, if you endure to the end, you'll be saved. That's the good news at that time. Verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, we, we, we read about that back in Daniel. He's going to set himself up as, as the Lord in the temple. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Does it sound like Jesus is preparing people to go through this time, or to not, or, or is he preparing them that they're not going to have to go through it? Go through it. They're going through it. You can. Jesus is teaching these people; they are going through it. When you hear some things, that's going to begin. See the beginning of sorrows, and then all the nations are going to hate you. And if you endure to the end, I'll save you. He's not telling them, "Don't worry about that day." He's telling them, "You better stay in the Word." Verse twenty-three. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or though, there, believe it not. If anybody says, I'm Christ, or if anybody says, there, that one sent in the temple, that's the Christ, don't believe it. For there shall arrive false Christs and false prophets, and shall, grow, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now some people want these signs and wonders to be tricks. I take them to be real, legitimate, supernatural, miracles hmm. that God has allowed Satan to perform just like we saw with the the people back in Egypt when they when Moses came in and, and did all those things okay but behold, behold I have told you before wherefore if they shall say unto you behold he is in the desert go not forth why would he why would Jesus be in the desert isn't that where he went it is for 40 isn't years that where, isn't that where he went didn't he go out in the wilderness a uh-huh. lot and, and do those yeah. things don't believe it Behold, he is in secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. They're going to be able to see it, like a lightning coming. They're clearly going to be see the Son of Man. Wow. Now, does that sound like what Paul says when he says twinkling of an eye? <laughs> totally, totally different events. Totally different events. For wherever, wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. Hmm. 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be, sa shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's what Paul was talking about over in 1 Thessalonians 1. Again, I ask a question. They can see it. That, this is not a twinkling in the eye moment. This is something for all the world to see. It's going right. to make them. And you know, if you think of, well, let me just keep moving. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. You see, the angels are here. Before it was just the archangel. This is the whole, all of them. many angels. Okay? Legions of and angels. And what are they going to They're going to gather his elect. They're going to gather the little flock. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is not, right? Isn't that what we're going through? I mean, April and I are walking around right now going, man, you can tell the good weather's just about here because things yeah. are starting to pop a little bit, right? That's what he's saying. Hey, you can tell, you can see that, and you know what's coming in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay? So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. When you see all these things, I'm telling you, you better be prepared to leave. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That's a generation of vipers. He's not talking about the people, the, 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 the linear generation that was on the planet at the time. And some people will use that verse to say, see, everything got fulfilled back then because that generation had to be alive. It's a generation of vipers that John was talking about in Matthew 3. Look at Matthew 3. Keep your hand here. Look at Matthew 3. I'm getting people looking at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> Oh, generation of vipers. Matthew 3, verse 7. John the Baptist is out baptizing. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. That's what he's saying you know, over here. Okay, That generation of vipers, it's not going to pass off until everything's complete. That's when it will come off. He's not talking about the people that were on the planet necessarily at the time. Now, you know, in the context, he's not teaching there's going to be a dispensation of grace coming. But that generation of vipers, that evil generation, mm -hmm. that, that spirit of antichrist, it's going to be out here again. Let me go over here to this chart. Sorry, April. It's okay. But it's going to be out here again. Right? We just saw it. false Christ, false prophets, generation of vipers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the generation he's talking about there. Uh, okay. But of that day, uh, where am I? Verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to reconstitute them. But the words will last forever. Verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now this is what people often say. Jesus is talking about when ta Jesus is talking about the rapture here. But as uh, the days of Noah were, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They didn't have a care in the world. They were eating, they were drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. There was no stress. Before the flood came upon the earth, it was a time of great economic prosperity. Wisdom was probably increasing. Knowledge was probably increasing. It was the roaring 20s. We all wish we could get back there. Right? We all want the roaring 20s back now. It was a great time. And Jesus says, it's going to be just like that here. We don't have time to go out and study it, but think about all the things in Revelation where it talks about the merchants of the world are so upset when Babylon gets destroyed. It's going to be a time of great economic, worldwide wealth. Like the towers came down. Exactly, just like the towers came down. Okay? And it's going to be just like they're going to be eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So, okay, so let's just stop there. As in the days that were before Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So there's Noah and his family, and then there's the people that are eating and drinking, right? Uh -huh. Okay, those are the evil people. Right. Okay. 
That's the they. Verse 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Okay, so who's to them in that passage? It's the evil people, right? Not Noah. Right. Okay, it's the evil people that were taken away. So shall also be the coming of the Son of Man. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now what they teach is, see, Jesus is talking about the rapture here. Because he's going to come back and he's, there's going to be two in the field. One's going to be taken and the other's going to be remaining. And they say, well, the one's going to be taken into the rapture. Except that's not what it teaches. Hmm. The, the, the verses actually teach the opposite. The one that gets taken, taken is, is going it, to eternal damnation. Is the unbeliever. That's the unbeliever. Jesus is not teaching the rapture here. Okay. Verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. We, we looked at that already. What you see is Jesus is not teaching a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, the body of Christ. He's not talking about the church, the body of Christ. He's not, he's got no teaching at all to tell this group, this people, that they're not going through the tribulation. He's telling them you are going to go through it. And these are the signs of the times that you need to pay attention to so you know when it's happening, so you need, so you can stay in this book and compare what you see with your eyes versus what the book says, is don't walk by sight because your eyes are going to fool you. Hmm. Walk by faith, not by sight. Um, look at John 14. It's another one people will use to say, well, see, Jesus is talking about the rapture. This will be the last one. This first verse here is very famous because of the way it gets used on TV by a certain talk show host, and he totally takes it out of his context. <laughs> Uh, John chapter 14, verse 1. Oh. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also go. See, he's, he's teaching his apostles about the rapture. He's going to go away, which, of course, they don't even understand that issue yet. But he, he's going to go away, and then he's going to come back, and he's going to rapture them out. Hmm. Okay, that, that's not what Jesus is saying. Again, rightly dividing will fix the answer for you before you get right. very far into this. Because Jesus did not have the rapture in mind. Okay, but look at Luke uh, 19. When it says, I go and prepare a place for you, that's New Jerusalem, right? I, I go to prepare a place. That's the yeah, New Jerusalem and the kingdom, yeah. and he's going to come back receive you unto myself and then it, it's so interesting he says if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again so what's he what's he telling the apostles let's talk before we leave here let's talk what is he telling the apostles he's going to die they don't really understand that you can read the rest of the passage but he's going to die and he's going to go to heaven and prepare a place for them and he's going to come back and he's going to gather them to him okay he's going to go prepare the kingdom new jerusalem he's going to bring it back and then look what it says if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, be, there ye may be also. So let's take it backwards in the verse here. Where is where is Christ? Right now? In no. Heaven, in, 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 oh, okay. He'll be on he, earth. Right. He's on earth. Right. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Where is he coming again? To the earth. Mm-hmm. And receive you unto myself. So I'm here. Jesus is here on earth. He's going to receive them unto himself. That where he is, they may be. Where is Christ? On earth. He's on the planet. If you just read the read the verses on the page, the words on the page, it tells you it can't be the rapture. Because Jesus is here. He's not there. Right. In the passage. In the okay. passage, right. Look at Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They already have in their mind this kingdom thing. When Jesus tells them he's coming again, that shouldn't surprise them. They've already, they're asking about that. 
He said, therefore, verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. There it is. There's John 14, 1 through 3 right there. He goes into a far country, heaven, to, to get re received for himself a kingdom. And what's he going to do? Is he going to stay there? He's going to return. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and, and it goes on. You see in verse 14, the citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. You can uh, look at it yourself, but the cross-reference to Luke 19, 14 would be Acts 7, where Stephen gets stoned. Stephen's oh. the messenger. Oh. Okay. Well, I, I think that's probably enough. Um, I, I've got many more here, but that's enough. We've been on this four weeks. I hope at the end of all of this, there's another passage where it talks about Jesus is going to come and be on the planet, and Mount, the Mount of Olives is going to split when he lands on the planet. What we teach, the rapture teaches, is that we're going to meet in the air. Right. Okay. His second come, Jesus' second coming involves him coming back and touching ground, touching the planet Earth and Mount Olive, so they can't be the same if one's in the air and one's on the planet. Right. We have many more. I said we're going to be done there. I spent a lot of time on that, probably more time than I've spent on this than I, than I probably spent on any other side study, if, if you will, because I think it's so very, very important. I, I don't, it's just not something for a theological debate. If you've noticed, all the times Paul talks about this, he talks about comforting yourself right. and edifying yourselves. And I told you before, this is important. Right. This is important. This is how you stay grounded. This is one of the ways you stay grounded in sound doctrine. If you don't stay grounded in sound doctrine, you will lose this issue of your hope. Right. Okay, Paul says, you know, it, it, that hope to get us through the tribulation of the time that we live in. You know, he, he says it's a present evil world. He says man is going to wax worse and worse. He calls it this present distress. Romans 8, the section that we started from, he talks about the whole creation groaneth and travail until now. Yeah. Even us that have the first fruit of the Spirit. But there's a time coming. He says the sufferings of this time, present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. These are all references to the rapture mm -hmm. and that new body and the judgment seat of Christ and the ruling and reigning with, with Christ in the eternities and in the heavenly, for eternity in the heavenly places. It's just not a secondary doctrine. I would encourage everybody, if they, if they can't have 100% complete confidence in the teaching of a pre-tribulation rapture, reach out to me on, on your own time if you want to, to, so you can get it settled. You can't believe it because I say it's true. you got to believe it because that's what the verses right, say. Right, right. But it is important. Don't, don't not come to a conclusion on this. And the only conclusion you can come to is that there is a pre-tribulation rapture mm -hmm. For the church of the body of Christ. Right. Yep. Okay. We said at the beginning, Paul's the only one that teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Everybody else in the Bible, everybody else in the Bible teaches that the little flock is going to go through the tribulation. Right. Nobody talks about the body of Christ because they don't have it in mind. The only person who talks about the body of Christ is Paul. Correct. Okay. But everybody else is preparing the little flock to go through the tribulation. Paul tells us, you're not appointed to wrath. You've been saved from that. And with that in mind, quit worrying about it. Don't stock up for it. Don't have that in mind. Get on with being the ambassador for Christ today. You've got a business to do. It doesn't involve all that other stuff out there. Don't worry about right. it. Don't get wrapped up in it. Don't worry about the signs of the season and the times and the seasons. Get on with being having that reconciliation, that ministry of reconciliation. Okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love. We do thank you for your grace. We do thank you that we have been saved from the wrath to come, that we don't have to worry about going through the tribulation, that we should comfort and edify ourselves with this information, but also that we should unencumber ourselves with any thinking or concern about that issue in our lives so that we can focus on living as who we are in Christ and completing our vocation, walking worthy of our vocation, that is to be an ambassador for Christ here on planet Earth, be light in the middle of a perverse nation. We can shine forth and, and stand firm for the gospel of the grace of God, that you are not imputing sin to the world today, that they will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that that's possible simply by believing that Jesus Christ died for their sins, for my sins, was buried and rose again the third day for our justification. 
just believe that simple message and we get, get translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son forever have any, a, a hope and an eternity and a destiny in the heavenly places and again we will miss the tribulation we will be raptured out before the tribulation we don't need to worry about that the tribulation should be something though that we use that should, should give us energy concern to get our family members and our loved ones saved so that they don't have to go through that. We do thank you for your love, we thank you for your grace, and we give you praise in all things, Lord. In your name, amen. Amen. Great, thank you. Okay, that ends that.